Introduced in 1982, the Group B rally regulations are often heralded as a golden era for rallying, giving rise to some of the fastest and most powerful off-road machines ever to run on four wheels. But rally is a dangerous sport, and there's no denying that Group B was one of the most dangerous eras in its history. Today, we're talking about one of the many iconic monsters birthed to take on the challenge. This is the story of the Ford RS200. In the early 1980s, Ford was preparing an entry into the upcoming WRC. It had been announced that a new set of regulations would be introduced in 1982, designated Group B, created to allow for more engineering freedom and more entertaining competition. Group B was a relatively broad class, and cars built for it were permitted to race in numerous events, including the World Sports Car Championship. WSC already had its top class though, Group C had taken care of that, but on the dirt, Group B would be the new king. Initially, Ford had been developing a rallified version of the Escort Mark III. They were keen for the Escort name to carry Ford's rallying mantle forward for the sake of its off-road ancestors. The car would be called the Escort RS1700T. Powered by a 1.8 litre Cosworth inline 4, capable of producing around about 300 horsepower, and only built with rear wheel drive, higher ups at Ford were worried the Escort wouldn't have the teeth to survive the new class. Then there was the optics of it. Ford were trying to present themselves as a high tech car company of the future, and entering another front engine rear drive Escort into the WRC just wasn't going to cut it. The Escort RS1700T was scrapped, but the appetite for racing was still strong within Ford's management, and so the call was made to go nuts with it. They were going to build a brand new car. If Ford were going to build a brand new car to race in the WRC, they wanted to be damn sure it was worth their time, effort and cash. Criteria number one was that it had to be all-wheel drive. They knew they would be competing against all-wheel drive machines from Audi and Peugeot. Next on the checklist was lightness. This new car would effectively be a marginally homologated prototype, and so lightness was a given. They chose to make the car out of glass fiber reinforced plastic, or just fiberglass if you're busy, and to turn things around fast, they outsourced the production of the body to a company already well versed in fiberglass production. Reliant. Yes, that one. The RS200, as this new rally car would be known, was being developed in England, and I guess if Reliant had one thing going for it, it's that it was close by? Ford brought in legendary race car designer Tony Southgate to design the chassis for the RS200, a task made a bit complicated by the fact the engineers insisted the engine should be in the middle of the car and the gearbox should be at the front of the car, meaning power had to be sent from the mid-mounted engine, tucked behind the cockpit, all the way to the front of the car, where the gearbox was, and then the rear wheels share had to then traverse the full length of the car in the opposite direction. The body was designed by Gear, and Ford sprinkled in a characterful panache in the form of whatever they could find in the parts bins, and voila, all they needed now was a power plant. The 1.8 litre turbocharged Cosworth 4 pot developed for the Escort 1700T was dropped in the little car, giving the 200 homologation road cars 250 horsepower and the full fat racing version between 350 and 450 horsepower depending on the setup. Despite this, the power to weight ratio of the RS200 trailed many of its competitors, and in combination with an engine that was very slow to react at low RPM, it was clear that WRC wasn't going to be easy for Ford. If you're enjoying the video so far, tap the like button. It makes a big difference. Thanks. Delays made things much harder. It was already 1986, and the company had yet to race the car in real anger. Worse yet, they hadn't homologated the superior Evo version of the car, meaning the car they started the 1986 season with was in effect a modified production unit, much heavier and slower than the car Ford had hoped to have run. The second race of the season in Sweden was the first point at which the plucky little car showed any real promise, with the RS200 managing a podium finish. This, however, would prove to be the car's greatest achievement in Group B, and celebrations were short-lived. The very next event was the Portuguese Rally, which saw a turning point for the entire class. 
An RS-200 left the track after the driver lost control, colliding with a group of spectators. Three people died at the scene, with another succumbing to their injuries in hospital later on. The tragic loss of life in Portugal had illuminated the writing on the wall for the Group B racing class, at least insofar as the WRC was concerned. However, one final blow would seal its fate. The Tour de Corsa is a road rally that takes place on the island of Corsica. In 1986, it was where Henry Toivonen and Sergio Cresto perished after their Lancia Delta S4 careened into a ravine and exploded. Group B died with them. As FISA announced later the same day that Group B would not be continuing in 1987 and the proposed Group S replacement class was canned. Ford had been developing a car for Group S, an even more monstrous iteration of the RS200, though it's not thought that any prototype of this car had been built before the annulment of the class. However, RS200s lived on, taking on Rallycross years after the death of Group B, seeing some success, but most fascinating of all was the fate of one lucky RS200 Evo road car that was reworked to compete in the IMSA GTO class in the late 1980s. It was powered by a ridiculous 750 horsepower 2 litre Cosworth engine, making it one of the most powerful cars on the grid for its inaugural season in 1989. But all was not well. Jeff Elganian, the madman responsible for entering the failed rally car into the IMSA GTO class, was racing his creation in the first event in Texas. Texas can get hot, and on that day, it was very hot indeed. So hot, in fact, that impaired by heatstroke, Elganian drove the car straight through the pit lane without stopping, and upon exiting the other side, promptly continued straight into the concrete barriers, wrecking the car. The car was rebuilt for 1990, but proved unreliable, and was subsequently rebuilt again for 1991. The impact of compounding mediocre repair work left the car in a sorry state, and it was retired after 1991 after having achieved impressively little during any of the three years that it raced. Audi were a bit better prepared for IMSA in 1989. You can watch my video about their insane 90 Quattro IMSA GTO here. Thanks for watching, and until next time, goodbye.